Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Data Diversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Data Diversity webinar, Five Essential Steps to Improve CRM Data Quality, sponsored today by Validity. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just a note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To find the Q&A or the chat panels, you can click on those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Olivia Hinkle. Olivia has provided data quality intelligence to top brands for more than 15 years. As director of product marketing, she oversees promotion of the validity data solutions, which help businesses around the world optimize their CRM implementations by establishing data quality best practices. And with that, let me get the floor to Olivia to get today's webinar started. Olivia, hello and welcome. So I had to unmute. Hello. How are you? <laughs> Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound good. Great, great. Well, I guess I'll I'll take it away. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Let me skip on past here to my next screen. So this is me. I'm Olivia. I am the Director of Product Marketing at Validity. Uh, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with us, we are the makers of Demand Tools, Grid Buddy Connect, Bright Verify, Everest, Sender Certification, and Mail Charts. Um, we love all things data and email and want to optimize organizations so they can meet their full potential through these important channels. Um, so I've been in the data quality space since 2003. My first CRM implementation was SalesLogix, um, and that's where I learned a lot about where chaos can ensue in a, sales, or in a uh, CRM implementation but I've been on the Salesforce platform for the majority of my career. And I'm sure we all have different CRMs that we work with out there, but I think the issues that we face are the same. Um, at least I've seen consistency between the few that I have worked in. So just a little bit more history. I started out in sales, wasn't really my thing. I was in my twenties then I went into sales enablement for a brief time. And then that's when I moved into CRM administration. Um, and I've spent the majority of my career as a certified Salesforce admin, um, a technical CRM, and now I've taken it on to do technical product marketing. So big data geek here. Um, love talking about data and thank you for taking the time to be with me today. So what we want to go over, what I want to go over it's just to look at what's going on in the state of our CRM data right now. So we do this report um, a couple of times and we have seen some good trends that I think are important to speak about, um, you know, externally and things like this, and then internally within our organizations. And then as we go through the discussion here, um, we're gonna hit on things like the culprits of CRM chaos, the major things that we see causing problems, the impact that we're seeing in the market, and then ways that we can combat this to make sure that we keep things calm, it's not chaotic, and that this CRM, that our tool, is actually a well-oiled tool that people can use and find success with. All right, so let's start with how companies are viewing their CRM now. So this is taken from our State of CRM Data Report, and it's, you know, it's got high expectations. 88% of companies agree that their CRM data is a cornerstone of their operations. So we are putting a lot of faith, a lot of trust, a lot of reliance on this data and on this application to steer our business decisions. But I think what we're finding over the past few years is there's just a disconnect between how we're talking about what we want to get out of our CRM and how we rely on it compared to our willingness or the effort that we're putting into keeping it in good health and doing what is necessary to make sure that the data inside of our CRM is actually steering us in the right direction. So a little bit further into our research, you know, we wanted to know, like I was saying, how we are prioritizing the health of our CRM data. So it was a little concerning that we put this huge reliance on it, but then only 55% of companies um, don't have a full-time employee dedicated to CRM data quality. And most of the time that sits with the admin. Sometimes you can split out that responsibility, but you know, over half of us aren't doing the full justice for the well-being of our data, even though the large majority of us are relying on it so heavily. And then when we went down into the user level of this, 
we did find that 43% of the admins are frustrated because there is a lack of prioritization of data quality initiatives from leadership. And we'll illustrate a little bit further on too, just where we're seeing that disconnect. So hopefully you can have better conversations with your leadership to bring to light the needs of data quality and data management um, beyond what they might be thinking or, or even assuming. So let's look at the creators of these chaos. And, you know, like I said, I picked the top few that we've seen here. There are levels of detail that we can go deep on each of these that we're going to talk about. And we're going to hit the surface elements of all of them. But again, with the hopes of giving you something to take back and start executing on at your own organization. So first and foremost, managing your data alone. <laughs> I say this all the time. Managing data is a team sport. Even if you are an organization of one, you should be reaching out to others to help you learn how to manage your data properly, unless you are some sort of data quality expert and you've done this before. Um, but we'll also uncover the area where I think we're getting the most interaction um, by not managing our data alone and who we should be looking at just in the light of different data regulations and policies that we are all up against. The next thing, data hoarding. So keeping data that we don't need. We've all seen the show, data hoarding. Hoarding doesn't lead to anything good. We have to have a very explicit reason for having the data that we house. Um, and again, having a data management team and not managing data alone will help prevent data hoarding. Uh, Project-based data management. So functioning as if data management is something you turn on and off when needed will absolutely set you up for failure. So, you know, managing this alone, doing it only sporadically, these are not good practices to have in your arsenal of how you're going to approach data that you rely on to make business decisions. And then unproductive end user experience. So this one <clears throat> is it's a piece of the data quality conversation that honestly, I don't think has had enough or even recognized. But when we talk about our CRMs, you know, we're putting our users in there to use this as a tool. And if we are not considering that we are giving them a business system, you know, and that they are not designed necessarily for the end user, we're going to be doing ourselves some injustice on, um, you know, the chaos that we create inside of our CRM. And then poor data quality. So everything we've talked about is going to lead to poor data quality. And yes, we can go levels deep on where we should be looking at our data quality. But if your goal is to have good data quality, you have to consider all of these things and all of these creators of chaos to get there. All right. So for me, these are like little snake bites inside your, your CRM, right? And we've got to get that anti-venom. We've got to get the things in place to prevent this stuff from happening. Um, so let's take a look at some of that. But before we do, the other behavior that I've seen that I think is a real problem and also causing chaos and just deteriorating our um, data quality is just how we view it. So we are setting the bar way too low for our data quality. Um, when in our in our research, you know, we saw 30, 64 percent of CRM admins are confident in the quality of their data, which is great. That's encouraging. But when we looked deeper, 63% of those admins say that less than 80% of the data is accurate and complete. So in my opinion, this is just too low. I don't think we're being aggressive enough with the standard that we set for where our data should be. And especially when you think about introducing that data, you know, just into reports. If we start very simply, we're all doing this now, running reports out of our CRM. But when we move into digital transformations like AI, the accuracy and completeness of our data is paramount because our artificial intelligence is only going to be as good as the data that we feed into it. So it's that age old story that we've always heard about CRM, garbage in, garbage out. So we can't set the bar too low, especially when, you know, 58% of admins are struggling to maintain data cleanliness, right? This is becoming a problem. And I think because it's so hard, that's where we're like, okay, I'm I'm close, I got 60%, 70%, maybe 80% of the data accurate. Um, you know, this is good enough just because it has historically been so hard for people to keep their data in good standing. Um, but the thing is, if we don't, it costs us. So we are losing on average 20% of our revenue because data quality is, is a barrier for us when really it should be the accelerator. So what do we do about it? <laughs> there are five ways that I think we can calm a lot of this and really just prevent problems before they start or recognize a problem when it's about to begin so we can cut it off at the pass. The first thing, and these are just going to be the opposite of five that we saw that were creating the chaos, you have to have a cross-functional data team. Um, 
the rest of these tips will fall short if you're trying to manage data as a one man team. Um, you know, I mean, yes, there's certain situations where we have small teams and, you know, we're talking to each other, but for us that have, you know, larger organization, more moving pieces, it is really paramount for us to be able to sit down with those teams and talk our way through what is going on. So this to me is just a first foundational element to consistently good data quality and having really good data practices and staying up to date on what they are. So why should you do this, right? Um, you're gonna hear this legal theme throughout, right? It keeps you in legal compliance. Um, it ensures the data is useful for all departments. It helps stave off data quality issues, it makes the data more trustworthy. And of course that then gives you more accurate reporting to lean on. So let's look at an example of this, right? You've got an admin and you want them to spot issues in the data and clean it up, but if there are legal regulations, it's really not the admin's job to know that. That is the specialty of somebody in your legal team. So the legal team should be able to say, hey, this is what you're going to look for. This is what we can't have, or this is how we have to handle it. And then it's the admin's job to go ahead and prevent or spot it systematically so we can keep the data you know, within complying with legal regulations. Um, if you are not talking to people in different departments, a lot of times you're going to be tracking the same information in multiple fields, which just deteriorates reporting. It also makes it look like the data is not complete. So if we are tracking multiple um, or the same information in multiple fields, that that is just creating more chaos. I'm going through a process right now where I'm trying to integrate something and I'm bringing in pieces of information and my marketing operations person was like, hold up, we have fields already that capture pieces like this. So let's make sure that we're properly adding to it um, in those fields and not just creating a whole new experience for reporting to come off of that skews our numbers. I wouldn't have known this had I not engaged with my marketing operations person. So it's important that we get those nuggets of information from other people who just experience the organization and the data differently. Um, and the thing is, we won't know where overlap occurs if we don't talk. So I might go in there and be able to add a field. Somebody else might be able to add a field. And so having, you know, only one point of admin entry or at least a controlled point of that is imperative, but really you can't support that unless you were sitting down as a team and talking through it. Um, and, you know, it just, it ensures alignment and make sure everybody else is on board, that they understand they can take this back to their teams. So, so what does that look like? What, who do we involve? And in my experience, we've had marketing. Um, and if your marketing and marketing ops are separated under different teams, maybe, um, you know, you make sure that you've got the demand gen side, the marketing operations side, your IT team involved, because these are, you know, technology systems, you're going to be relying on your IT team to help keep them healthy as well absolutely have to have a sales representation in there. Um, service, of course, because, you know, CRMs are widely used by sales and service teams to be successful and serve our customers well. Um, and then I've seen it where we also have, you know, people from our product team on the board of, you know, just this cross-functional board of, of data-minded folks who keep everything aligned. So, I wouldn't, I would start with too many before I start excluding people. And then you can figure out, okay, who needs to be here? Who doesn't, um, you know, what value are they bringing? And, and maybe they pinch hit during certain projects, but it will help you identify who that core set of people are um, just by opening up the conversation to them and asking for their input. But, you know, is there any proof in this pudding? Am I just saying this because, you know, I'm, I work for a data quality organization? And no, I mean, there are other authorities out there who are recommending the same thing. So data governance initiatives have resulted in a 25% improvement in data quality alone. Um, and so in our historical studies, we have found that companies with a cross-functional team have more confidence in their data, more accurate sales forecasts, and better lead conversion rates, just because they're able to use that data to engage with their market better. Um, and this cross-functional team can act as your data leader. So a lot of times people are like, well, I don't have anybody to lead it. You're the person then. You be that person to lead it and then put the onus of leadership on the team as you know a group effort. Um, because historically, we've seen that only about 20% of companies have a cross-functional data governance team. So while it is becoming more widespread, I still don't think it is 
taken as seriously as it needs to be. Like we have a sales department, we have a service department, a marketing department. Why do we not yet have a data department? It just keeps getting tucked under into all these other ones. And we all know data is king. We have to keep it, you know, up to snuff so we can enter into these digital transformations successfully and frankly, keep up with our competitors who are probably doing the same thing. So just from getting the right minds in the room and talking through this stuff, you can see an increase in an improvement in your data quality from that alone. And those are just conversations, right? No investment there other than your time. All right, quick win number two, don't hoard data. <laughs> this seems very obvious, um, but hang hanging on to data is not good. And especially when we have regulations coming down to us, you know, changing constantly, we have to be very clear with what we have and why. So what I found interesting, and this is a bit of an older stat that I'm going to share with you, but I still think it's important to look at so we know where we've come from, because if we don't know where we're coming from, we don't know how to get to where we're going. So why is this important? 72% of IT decision makers have confessed to being data hoarders. Um, and you know we know this can drive up storage costs, not just in CRMs, but anywhere. Um, so it, it doesn't make sense to me why this is happening. And the most common reason is that it just takes too much time to clean up the data and purge it. Um, I think we also have this visceral response that if we get rid of it, then, oh my gosh, we won't have it anymore. And what if we needed it for insights? And, you know, what if, what if, what if? Um, but if we don't stop doing this, we are at the risk of not being in legal compliance because you can only hold on to certain pieces of data for so long and driving up those storage costs, which Salesforce folks will tell you that storage does not come cheap. So we have to be cognizant of, you know, just what we're doing with our data and how long we keep it, why we're keeping it. Um, interestingly, though, 40% of consumers would also stop buying from a company that fails to control how much unnecessary or unwanted data it is storing. This to me is reason enough to, to really look at what I'm doing with my data and not hoarding it. And, you know, there's a couple different reasons here, right? So Having more data forces you to have a larger carbon footprint. Right now, 2% of the global energy-related pollution emissions are caused by data centers, which I hate to say this, is the same amount created by the airline industry. Um, and you know, if you have a data breach, the more data you hold, the greater the consequences are for you and your consumers if that happens. And we all put up our best defenses and I get that. And I know we're all thinking we do everything right, but there's going to be something or someone who finds their way through those barriers. There always is. That's why this is always evolving. So we have to play on the defensive here. We can't be reactive. We have to be very proactive in how we approach this. And, you know, the projection is that because data centers run for 24 hours a day, that by 2030, we're expected to use as much as 8% of all the electricity on the planet. So there's a conscientious effort, you know, going on right now for people saying, not only do I not want you to have this information sitting around about me so somebody can go and steal it, but there's an, an enviro environmental impact that is going on that I just prefer would not be a part of. So I think it's important here that we listen to our consumers. And if that isn't reason enough for you, try this one on. <laughs> on average, only 15% of the data that we have is business critical. So to me, this is like, okay, hone in on the pieces of data that help you operate and serve your audience better. And in my experience, that is your contact data, email verification. Um, you know, it's a data quality effort, but it's also a marketing tactic to protect sender reputation, decrease bounce rates, um, not waste resources on contacting fake people. Um, so you really just have to be focused on where you are ensuring that you have the data um, and that the, the stuff that you are hanging on to is serving a purpose that you are able to execute with it. And it's stuff that you're using. It's not just there for the what if. So how do we not be a data hoarder? First, familiarize yourself with data regulations. And that's what I'm going to be calling in, you know, my, my law team, my legal team here to say, what do I need to know? How do I need to operate? Define the need for each data point, and I mean each field in your CRM. We all have little you know, help bubbles and, and little documentation areas on our fields where we can say why a piece of information is in our system, where it is being used. So wherever you document this, I would actually document it more places than not on that field level information and also in just a general document of how your data is used and how it flows, have that definition and have a data archive plan in place, right? Make sure it's in compliance with the regulations that your legal team has talked to you about and 
and get it out of your system and then purge useless data at least quarterly. I'm not saying quarterly is the exact cadence you need to be on, but for me, that's at least, I know I'm looking at it four times a year. I'm going to make sure that each quarter, you know, we're, we're doing the cleanup um, and I'm doing all this stuff. I think will be helpful because it takes that emotional response out of the equation. This makes everything feel very need-based instead of what if based. So if you are going, you know, staying in your, in the lines of these are the legal responsibilities I have, this is how we're using it as a business. And if you don't see any of those reasons for hanging on to a piece of data, you can get rid of it. And the thing is you will be in more trouble. If you have a data breach, you will have higher fines, um, you know, for holding on data to data that you should have purged. So get a plan in place to archive it. You know, if quarterly isn't enough, make it more frequent than that, but at least start there um, and have an idea, you know, of how you want to start approaching this, which also leads us into this next quick one pretty nicely, because how do you get rid of stuff? How do you not hoard things if you don't know what's going on with your data? So you have to get to know your data, right? This, I probably should have mentioned this before that last one, but um, I just like the way this flowed is like, okay, well, how am I going to get to the point of getting rid of the stuff I don't need if I really don't know what is going on in my data? So you can't really manage it if you don't know anything about it. So how do we do this? We do this through profiling. And profiling is not sitting down and saying, this is the ultimate state that we want our data to get to. There is a point in time that you do that, but that is not now. This is where it helps you understand your current data situation, right? You're going to uncover your data quality issues. Um <laughs> you know, where you might have duplicates, unstandardized data, missing information, missing decision support. Um, again, documenting how your data flows. So understanding which data elements are used um, and how they impact other programs going on, whether it's a marketing program or other systems that feed the data into or out of the CRM. Um, defining the data in each field and where it's used, right? So that's part of this documentation. And this aids in process improvement because this is actually your first step to ending project-based data management. Um, and you can use what you find in your profiling to kick off your data governance meetings. Um, so let's say, let's say you use demand tools, which is our tool. We do offer a free assessment. And we'll talk about that at the end. Um, but it'll, you can run it. It'll tell you where your weak spots are. And you can then say, okay, look, I ran this assessment. Your first data governance meeting is gonna be about tackling these duplicates because that was really what we saw as crippling the CRM. And you go in and say, this is where we've found the duplicates. Now let's have a discussion for each object, leads, accounts, contacts, each field, how we're going to move the data when we are merging information together. Um, why we're going to be making these decisions, you know, what weighting scales you might have for why you keep one lead source over another, right? You're going to have to get down into the minutia of this to make sure that you use what you found in profiling to move toward a path of success and, and fixing those weak spots in your data. So do we really know our data? Is that something that people are actually doing? So right now, three in 10 report that they are, um, or that they are not continuously monitoring the quality of their data. And this is where we start seeing the disconnect between our admins, um, you know, people who are in the data constantly and people at the VP or executive level, because the, the people at the VP or higher level were 20% more likely than average to believe that the company monitors data quality. So what we were seeing was this disconnect of maybe assumptions being made higher up because they were like, well, this is table stakes. This is what we should be doing. So I'm, I'm sure we are. Um, but where, you know, when we look at the end users, they're like, well, sometimes, right? Like not all of us, maybe every once in a while, but it's not a consistent thing that we're doing. Um, so I think we have to take this and say, all right, I need to be very transparent with my leadership on how we are managing our data so they can understand that when you run your reports, when you are making your decisions and strategic moves based on this information, understand how it has been cared for, Um you know, we, we throw around terms like data driven all the time, but do we really know how to care for the data for it to drive us in the correct direction? Right. And that's what we're all here to learn about. All right. So quick win number four, this is getting back to that end user experience. And we have to not assume that our business systems make data entry and usage easy. Yes. You know, their business systems, CRMs, they make reporting on this, gathering this information all in one spot, really simple and really pretty to look at. It's, you know, it's very easy to access. Um, but as the name suggests, these are business systems. They were not 
created for the end user. They were created for the business. End users typically have to work faster than what the system allows them to. So we just have to stop making the assumption that because it's good for the business, it's also a good experience for our end users working in it every day. What we have found though, when we talk about, okay, well, is this really causing chaos inside my CRM data? Yes, it is. 49% of companies say human error is the biggest cause for data inaccuracies. And when only 40% of our sales updates are entered into the CRM on average, we have to ask ourselves why. I don't think it's because, you know, our sales team just hates technology and doesn't want to give us the information. Um, I think it's a little bit more than that. And it just, it slows them down. So let me show you what I mean. All right, so what you're seeing here is an image of a Salesforce screen. And if you look at the top, and so ignore the detail on the page, but the top is really what's interesting here. This is a typical view of the tabs that a salesperson, a customer success person, somebody engaging with your customers, this is what it's going to look like for them as they're doing that. This is what it looked like for me when I was in CS. I would have a different tab open for the account, one for the contact, one for the case, um, my counterpart in sales would do the same, but have, you know, his opportunity open. And this takes a lot of calories in my brain to, to work through. And it's tiring um, to look at these page layouts and figure out, okay, well, where do I put this in piece of information? They told me, you know, that they're thinking about looking at this product and this person switching roles. Like, where do I go to manage all this stuff? And jumping in between these huge pages with a ton of fields, um, can just be really tiring. And so that's why only 40% of the stuff is making it into the system. And I think it's also because, you know, people are just doing it outside of the system. So the information exists, the sales person is able to have it to execute on, but the, the business doesn't. And that's the whole point of our CRM is to take what interactions are happening and put it into a system where we can get insight and, and change and better how we are approaching our market and the sales and service that we provide for them. Um, so it's kind of no wonder that this is happening. If we're forcing people to jump from screen to screen, there's going to be some inaccuracies um, causing fatigue, um, you know, and th this should have the opposite impact. This, again, should be the accelerator for them. Um, and historically, we have seen that 80% of sales reps are saying that their companies require them to use a CRM. So this isn't a choice, and I don't think it should be, um, but we just need to give them a better way to accomplish this because this is tiring. It doesn't actually lend itself to real time, you know, note taking or updating while you're having that engagement, which is really frustrating. But salespeople love their spreadsheets. We know this. <laughs> Ten percent of a sales rep's time has been known to be spent inside a spreadsheet to help them accomplish what they could wish they could do in the CRM. So they're moving back in time into these antiquated spreadsheets because. They're faster. They can hone in on the pieces of information they want, hide fields, move fields. You know, they have complete control and they're not distracted by other data, other users, the stuff that's in the system that they really don't need to focus on. Maybe they need to reference at some point in time, but for their day to day, that's not where their focus is. So what do we do about this? And we think the best approach is actually just bringing the spreadsheet into the CRM and it's streamlining the data entry process for every CRM user. We have a solution called Grid Buddy Connect, which is the image that you're seeing here. And this is inside of Salesforce. So you don't have to log into a different platform. You could if you'd like, but this embeds into Salesforce and it takes those big page layouts and it puts them into rows and columns. And the best part about this is it's not just one object. So you can edit multiple objects, different fields, all at the same time within one view. Okay, so this isn't possible anywhere else natively inside of CRMs which is typically why you have to look to a third party for this, because I'll say it again, <laughs> CRMs were built for the business, not the end user. So it's up to us to help this process become more manageable for our end users. And there are advancements being made, different consoles and views that we've had, but there's always something that's a little bit lacking that slows us down still that isn't getting us the increase in productivity that we're looking for. Grid Buddy Connect statistically has been shown to increase productivity by 10 times. Um, it gives them role specific workspaces too. So if I'm in sales, I can ignore some of these other fields that maybe I don't need to work with. And when I pull it into this view, I can just have the field that I know I need to update. If I'm on a discovery call, I know the fields I need to look at and I can have them here in my grid and just focus on that. 
But if I need to get to, you know, the contact or the account object fields, I can see those here as well, just with a quick expansion of, you know, one of those carrot icons. And what this is doing is a lot actually. So you're getting information into the CRM in a more timely manner, which means your reports are going to be more accurate and the velocity of the data that you have is faster. Um, it is now opening up your sales team and your service teams for more time to sell and provide better experiences for the customers you wish to have a relationship with. So we're able to focus on the customer again and not the data, but still get the information in there. Um, you know, data entry is more accurate because a layout is clear and fit for their goal, fit for the purpose of its use. Um, you know, and even if you're not in Salesforce, I, it's still beneficial to sit down and review this data entry process with users and ask them, where are the fail points? Where are the areas where you are getting stuck that is slowing you down, that may be causing you to track things outside of the CRM? You know, maybe it's that during the week it's tracked outside of the CRM and then at the end of the week they spend you know, four hours putting it back in there. That's double work that doesn't need to be done and it's time wasted and it's time away from the attention we should be giving to our customers. So whether you're, you know, Salesforce or not, um, any business system that you have people working in as their tool to expedite through an engagement with the customer should definitely be evaluated and you need to have those conversations. And again, this is a great thing for your data governance team, because then whoever is, you know, the catalyst for getting this all started doesn't have the onus of going out and asking everybody. You can then task each team with saying, go back to your teams, figure this out, and then let's get back together, find those fail points and figure out where we can make some moves and some positive changes. All right, and then quick one number five, <clears throat> invest in tools to manage and automate data quality processes. I have run the numbers myself. I have had customers run the numbers to say, you know, <clears throat> is, is all this stuff I need to do actually humanly possible with, let's say, the free out-of-the-box CRM tools or, you know, a hodgepodge of uh, Excel work and maybe some, you know, uh, massaging inside there and re-uploading back into the tool. And it's it's just not possible. So we need to start understanding that in order to manage our data quickly, effectively, and to keep up with how fast it changes. We cannot do this manually. It has to be an automated process, um, but you're going to have to go to a third party for that. But why should we? Everybody's like, well, this is another investment. My CRM was already really expensive. We pay enough money for it. Like, it should be clean. Totally agree with you. It's, you know, I wish that was the case, but poor data quality, duplicates, things like that. That's like your free gift with purchase when it comes with the CRM, right? So you will have to make an investment, but the good news is that data management solutions, investing in them can reduce your data management costs by 30%. So this is a study I found. I have a link there. All these stats, I give you a link or at least the uh, source of where I found it. And <clears throat> when you're looking at an ROI and you know evaluating, is this something I really need to do? Keep in mind that this action will, in fact, actually save you on your costs. So what does this look like? What should you even be looking for? What does a data quality solution normally do? What should it do? And these are the things I think we all should be looking for. Um, something that assesses your data, right? This is the step that helps you with profiling. So you can understand what you're doing now, where the problems are, and where to focus your attention to fix the issues. So those are the quick wins you're going to find. If you have something that assesses where you're at now, that can then be repurposed on the line. And now it's used as your monitoring tool to alert you to when things are a problem, to draw attention to stuff that you might not have noticed otherwise. So it, it's your you know eyes and ears when you can't be there so you can go off and do other you know, high impact projects. It absolutely should merge duplicate records. It should be doing this on you know, all the standard and custom objects that you have. But I think it's also imperative to ensure that it does cross object too. And when we talk about deduplication and merging, I'm coming at this from a point of you know, going in and finding the duplicates that exist now and cleaning them up, but also from a preventative point of view. You don't always wanna to have to be reactive to these duplicates. You want to cut them off at the pass and be able to handle them in real time if you can um, for the best experience, not only for you and your end users, but also your customers. Okay. And when you're merging duplicates, remember how I said back, you know, when you start off your conversation with your data governance team, talk about the fields, take a look at how 
and what flexibilities you have to keep the specific field values that you want, because there are solutions out there, ours included, that will allow you to get very granular at the field level to say, okay, I'm going to merge these records, but just because I'm keeping this one in the system, this ID remains because maybe it's connected to your integration. I want the lead source from the, the oldest record. I want to keep, um, you know, the account in the system that has the most activities and opportunity because that's the one that's being used. So you want to make sure that you have different ways to evaluate the data to ensure that you're keeping what you need in there um, and different rules that you can put in place. So there's flexibility to say at every field level, this is what I want to have done for whatever business reason you've decided is important. And these are all conversations that you will have with your data governance team. Um, it should definitely be able to standardize your field value. So here, this is, you know, coupled with the one below for mass modification or mass changing. What I've typically found, especially in the Salesforce world, is if you want to do any mass changes to your data, you are forced to export that out into a spreadsheet, massage the information there, and then re-upload it back into Salesforce. And all I've heard the whole time I've said that is human error, human error, human error. There are too many variables involved for me to feel comfortable that I've actually made that update successfully and accurately. I want a system that sort of has guardrails for me that says, okay, I'm going to query this information. This is the change I'm going to make to it. It shows you that, and then it allows you to proceed and just process it back into the system. There is no moving of the data other than just as it progresses through that process of changing it. So that's actually, it's funny because when people look for a data quality solution, they don't come to us and say, oh, I need to change all these records. I need to touch them all, right? They, they have a, a different problem. It's normally duplicates or they have to do an import because they're migrating databases. Um, but what we end up seeing is that these mass modification tools are actually the most widely used um, consistently throughout the use of the tool. So if you're thinking, I don't really need that, you might be surprised if you go in and test the functionality to see for yourself, like this is actually something I can use to make a huge dent in my life. Um, we had um, a success story talking about import saying, you know, I couldn't move data between systems, right? Even if you're combining two CRMs or you're combining data from one system to another system, whether it's an acquisition or you're just getting rid of a platform, that they can't do that unless they have a way to get that data cleanly back into their CRM. And it's really hard to do that with out-of-the-box tools. Um, and the keyword here is cleanly, you know, something that is going to dedupe for you on the way in, something that is going to standardize on the way in, again, with the same flexibility that the in the formulas that you see in Excel. You really want to have, you know, that familiarity and the and the functionality that is available there, because that's what we're all, we're all attuned to. Um, uh, something that you can get the information out of the system, of course, these are like sort of table stakes. And then something that helps you delete. So when we're talking about, you know, staying in compliance and getting rid of things and not hoarding data, we definitely want to have something that will help us get the information out of the system. Um, but what's nice about ours is we give you a nice preview so you can then archive that information if you need to, um, you know, if it's compliant and incorrect to do so. And then something that I think is overlooked too is managing record ownership. And in part because we do have territory rules and such inside of our CRM and we can route things and, you know, tell the records who they should be owned by. But as we've seen, you know, when 2020 hit and everybody was quitting jobs and moving jobs and it was just chaos, everybody's data was decaying like crazy. Um, and in part, it was because we, we weren't even telling the right people to manage the information because we didn't know how to move it around. We didn't have the right tools to do it. So something that can help you manage your record ownership. And, you know, let's say I quit tomorrow and I might book a business or my cases that I have open need to immediately be transferred to somebody else because what kind of customer experience is that if even for a few days, I don't have a point of contact to reach out to, you know, or the point of contact that I had, it just falls flat and, and I can't, I can't get to them anymore because now they're gone and I didn't know. Um, so I think that that's a really important piece. And then we talked about this before, but verifying contact data, these, sometimes there's like, okay, well, that's more of like a marketing type initiative. Well, you know what, jump on board marketing. Cause it's a data quality thing too. And, um, there's no reason that data quality and marketing shouldn't be partnered in this endeavor because of the impacts that it will have, not only on the data quality side, but like we talked about earlier, protecting your sender reputation and getting more information into an inbox that actually is real, um, so you're going to see 
overlap. And I think that's what's going to make this data governance team that's cross-functional exciting is because people will start realizing that, geez, these data quality efforts really do benefit me. And maybe I didn't understand that before, but I see it clearly now. And then of course, that needs to be able to be automated. It is awesome to get all this stuff set up, get all your settings in place, but you do not want to do this day in and day out. You want to open up your time to work on bigger impact projects. Um, and so once you've got that initial setup and feel, you want to be able to set it, sort of forget it, you know, but you, you also want to get some, some feedback from the system. So notifications and alerts are nice to have in a data quality solution, just so something is keeping its eye on your data and you don't have to actively go do it yourself. Um, but of course, you always have the chance to go in and manually do some modifications or do some, you know, cleaning up if you need to. And that's sort of the name of the game with data quality, right? You're never going to fully be out of the picture. It will never be fully automated because there's just some things we have to do hands on. And that's OK. That's not a, a failure, I think, of, of any of this. I think it's just, you know, part of the need for data quality. So are we moving in the right direction? What have we seen after we've done this study a couple of times? Um, are people getting it? Are we prioritizing our data the way we should be? And we saw earlier on, probably not, but are there positive changes being made too? And there are. So uh, a few things that we found is that 41% of the companies that don't have a full-time employee dedicated to CRM data quality do have plans to hire for that role in the next 12 months, which is great. Um, 52% of companies that are investing in CRM data management solutions now, which is a 49% increase from 2021, which is also great. People are realizing, yeah, this really isn't something I can do by myself. It is time prohibited. And um, solutions like ours will literally take something that used to take you months and now dwindle it down to taking minutes. So that alone, I think, in that time saving is enough to at least consider you know, a solution, maybe not ours, but to go out there and start looking at what is available to you because trying to do this manually is just, I think that would make anybody crazy. Um, all right. And then 55% say, here's this legal stuff again, the stringency of non-compliance penalties is what led them to reevaluate their data governance practices in the last 12 months. So again, if you don't have somebody on your legal team, get them there. 67% of us have um, said our legal teams gained a more prominent role in CRM data management, as they should. They should be a really tethered partner with us to say, am I doing this correctly? Because there are legal implications. So those are my five quick wins for you today on how you can go about looking at your data, things that you can implement, conversations you can start having with your team to make your data better. Um, I have some resources for you. We've got the state of CRM data management in 2024. I touched on a bunch of the information, but there's some really good nuggets in there um, with other key findings. And what was interesting, so I'll, I'll do a little spoiler, is some of the shady data practices that people were admitting to, of course, this is anonymous, but um, it, it was a little wild to see some of what was going on. So be sure to check that out. It's a free download on our website. And then the other one I'm showing you here is just where you can go and sign up for your trial of demand tools. Completely free, it's 14 days. Like I said, you can get a full assessment on your data. You can then use it for 14 days. In a production environment, if you are in Salesforce, it is not fully functional in production, but it will allow you processing um, and show you all functionality if you are connected to a sandbox. So if you did want to get that assessment on your um, production data, that is possible, but to actually test something full flow and see it process into Salesforce, you will have to get into a sandbox. So uh, hopefully that was helpful for you guys, gave you some new ideas, different ways to approach your data quality. And um, I'm going to pass it back to you for questions, Shannon. Olivia, thank you so much for this great presentation. Just a reminder, if you have questions for Olivia, feel free to put them in the Q&A section and just to answer the most commonly asked questions. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day uh, Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here, um, you know, we get this question a lot, Olivia, on a lot of different things. One of the biggest challenges, you know, um, uh, but so, you know, I, a lot of what you said, you know, is a drum that you, uh, I've been beating in my own company, but no one thinks the work to do the cleanup is valuable. How do we get buy-in to get started on fixing these issues? Yeah. So I think the buy-in piece starts with showing people like, these are the problems. So going to that profiling step, and at least if you're suspicious of duplicates of unstandardized data, things like that, where there's maybe 
even if it's invalid email addresses, right? Starting somewhere to say, we have a problem and showing them that. And then also sharing with them this research to illustrate like, we're not alone here. This isn't a problem I'm making up. This is very prominent in our space. There are things that we can do about it, but we have to we have to begin. <clears throat> and and you know the steps that I've laid out here could actually work as like an action plan that you could even present and say this is how we're going to go about this. You know and start filling in the details as you go. But I think the biggest part is just bringing awareness to the fact that this is a very common issue and that it does have detrimental effects on digital transformations like AI, which is really where. AI is going to shine is in our CRMs because that's where, you know, we're pulling our sales and service information from. So in, in this case, I would say you have to manage up and prove that there is an issue. And, you know, we are happy to help you do that as well. Love it. So let me, you know, so what is your definition of a quick win? So a lot of these have been classified as quick wins, but I don't, I don't know how, if I would define them that way. So um, are we saying a quick win is a year? Um, well, so I think some of this will take a little bit longer to implement into the fabric of your company. So, um, and the reason these seem like quick wins to me again, is because I live in the world of demand tools and I can go in even as, an, as a novice user and within minutes show you if there are hundreds of thousands of duplicates in my system. Right. Um, so when you talk about a data governance team, that might take a quarter to get in place, right? To really get things moving well and, and having a well-defined process. Um, but starting the conversation and at least getting people to buy in and have those initial conversations can be the piece of that quick win. Um, and just, you know, like I said, surfacing awareness to this. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your, your question completely. Was there more you were looking for? I certainly can uh, ask the question or to add more. Um... But it sounds very comprehensive to me. Uh, but I'll, let me move on and let me give her an opportunity to add any more if needed. So, Olivia, what tools would you recommend for us to start profiling our data, particularly those of us on Salesforce-based CRM? Sure. So, um, absolutely, run our assessment. It's free. It's you know, it's completely secure. Um, that's a great way to start. But if you're like, mm, I can't really do that. I can't install anything. It's just a nightmare to get past, you know, <laughs> IT or whatever. Um, you can start running exception reports inside of Salesforce. So run reports that says, show me how many contacts have an activity associated to them in the past year that don't have an email address or, um, you know, maybe where the phone number is blank um, or to the counterpoint of that, how many contacts are in my system that haven't had an activity in the last year, right? Like, why do I need this stuff if we're not talking to these people? Um, or maybe that's a point to re-engage with them. So you can do exception reporting like that inside of your CRM, whether it's Salesforce or not, just to start getting um, some insight there. And actually, if you go to the App Exchange, Salesforce Labs has um, some prepackaged reports you can get there. There's also a data quality trailhead that you can take that just tells you, you know, again, how to position this a little bit inside your organization and things to look at when you're talking about your data quality. Thank you. So Olivia, how does validity verify contact data? What aspects does it verify? For example, name, social security number, tax ID, address, et cetera? Yeah, no. So we um, focus on that contact data. So it's emails, phone, and mailing addresses because our focus is getting you into contact with the people that you want to, you know, experience your product and, and what you have to offer. So we use, um, well, not use, we are the, the owners of, the creators of Bright Verify, which is one of the longest standing verifications on the market. Um, it's very fast. You can, it's efficient. You can, you know, verify information quickly. It's not like it takes a while. And we have a lot of integration points. So uh, Bright Verify does integrate directly with demand tools to do verifications, but it also directly integrates inside of Salesforce. So you can put the power of that inside of the hands of your end users to say, you know what, I haven't, nobody's emailed this person in six months. Let's just do a quick verification to see if that email is still real. Um, and that alone is a time savings that you're going to see. So we focus on the on the uh, contact data verification. Very cool. So uh, how many clients or entries do you require as a minimum prior to moving a CRM from Excel to a CRM product? Or what criteria would you use for a small company who does not have an official CRM to have to start considering to have one? What, what, I'm sorry, what process would they take? Or could you ask it just one more time? 
Yeah. So really, you know, when should a company, especially a small company, consider getting a C investing in a CRM? You know, where when does it when do you move from Excel tracking your your leads in Excel to a, a official CRM? Yeah. When do we when do we bail on Excel? Um, well, I think it depends. And and my view is as soon as possible. There are scaled back, free, even um, experiences of most CRMs that you can start using, and. You know, if you are small, it's not always awful to use some of these in tandem, but I would say the sooner the better. Even if you're small, I don't think that's a reason to say, oh, we're small, we don't need a CRM. I think if you start now, the idea is growth, right? Um, maybe maybe not exponential growth. Maybe we have some mom and pop shops that want to stay relatively small. I still think you will have a better customer experience if you put your information into a system that helps you process it in a way that gives you better ways to engage with and interact with your audience. So um, if you have the budget for it, or if you can find a free offer or a scaled back offer that really fits those needs now, so let's say sales and service, um, I would say do it as soon as you can. Thank you. So uh, how do you go about uh and thank you, a very insightful presentation. And Olivia, how do you go about defining the handover among the members of that cross-functional team, uh, cross-functional data governance team? I'm sorry, you cut out at the beginning of that. How do I, what with the cross-functional team? Oh yeah, so uh, how do you go about defining the handover among members of that cross-functional data governance team? The handover, um, meaning who's responsible for what? Um, I guess I would say, you know, each each team representative. So you should have somebody representing each department involved. I would not make this a more expensive meeting than it needs to be, um, and use that person as the liaison back to the different department. And if it is, you know, a sales initiative where they're like, "I need this done with the data," I would let them lead that, and then the rest of the people on the team can act as the advisors and and guidance given to make sure that that is taken successfully to fruition. Um, I do think somebody needs to almost be the babysitter of this and ensure that the data governance team meets. Um, and I really like that to come from my admin because admins, they're powerful people and I, they know a lot, they have insight to a lot, they touch a lot of stuff. It's To me, it's a lot like product marketing, which is why I think I love both of them is I get to engage with so many different areas of the business and, and you know just have that exposure. So well, I said earlier that your data governance team could be your data leader. I did mean that, but I do think you need to have somebody who's saying, you know what, this is the team I'm going to nurture. I will be responsible for getting the meetings on the calendar, for um, you know, surfacing up new initiatives, or you know, maybe you find that the next meeting you have, you're like, okay, things are in a good spot, or you know, we don't have any mission critical things we need to address right now, and and you, you get hit sort of an easy spell, but. Um, I really prefer to have my CRM admin or my IT leader sort of lead this because it is technology um, and you need to have the brains in the room who understand how the systems are connected to sort of help lead these conversations as well. Thank you so much. And, you know, we've, we've got about uh, seven minutes left, got plenty of time for a couple more questions, so keep them coming. They've been great questions so far. Feel free to put them in the Q&A panel. So. Yeah. Olivia, you know, how does a successful cross-functional data team look like uh, in the real world? What does it look like? Mix of business analysts and technical folks? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, a representative from each department, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the most technical person. It has to be somebody who just understands the value in the data and what they're going to get out of it and what their team, how they are going to benefit from it. You know, a lot of people wouldn't expect that, having better data quality will lead to your sales team having more time to make, you know, each per person one extra call per month or reaching out to a new prospect each month because you freed up that time that they're not fighting against the data to figure out what's real and what's not. So I wouldn't say that your your team has to be a technical person from each department. You, yes, you need that. And I would probably, like I said, get that from the IT and the admin side, um, but just find the person who has a passion for the data. And, and who wants to be involved and can articulate back to the team, you know, the requirements, what is needed and why, and then who can also bring the team's feedback to you and the rest of the team to then consider and then implement any changes. So um, I think how it looks is going to be different from org to org, but I would start with inviting everybody to say, you know what, 
pick somebody on your team, whether that's the leadership or, you know, somebody else, that's fine, but pick somebody to come and be your representative. And let's talk about this because we need to start seeing the impact um, that our data is having on each individual team. Thank you so much. Uh, Olivia, this has been such a great presentation, very insightful and very helpful. Uh, uh, and thank you so much. Uh, and just one last question for you. You know, what's the biggest aha moment that the, your customers get when they implement validity? <laughs> um, so one of our case studies actually, and I have the pleasure of getting to talk with our customers and actually get this information from them. And I really love it. Um, but they were like, I, I didn't believe it, but it really is no joke that I, you can take stuff that took months. I mean, I had somebody come into a company, they had already been working on this project for six months. She completed in five minutes what they had been belaboring for six months. That's the aha moment of, okay, there is a better way to do this. I don't have to be resource strapped. I don't have to put more you know, money into this through people. I can use an automated system. Um, and I think it's too, just becoming aware that this stuff is available. I don't know how many people know what is available to them when it comes to the realm of data management. So um, those are the aha moments I see with our customers. And also, like I said, a lot of them will come because they're doing a data migration. They need a tool that can handle it, or they've got like a sh just a ton of duplicates that they need to get cleaned up quickly. But what they start finding out as they start using the system is that data just needs to be massaged all the time. There are constant requests and changes. And even if it's just five records, hunting and pecking through five records in the CRM is going to take at least 20 minutes. Doing that in you know, an automated system like ours or something where you can very quickly query multiple records at a time takes seconds. So the aha moment is... I can, I can do this all day long, or I can have a system that helps me along and just seeing the value in that investment and what it brings back. Oh, I love that. That's a, that's, that is a great aha moment. <laughs> um, Olivia, you know, we did have one more um, question sneak in here. Um, we've got a little bit of about four minutes left, a little less than four minutes, but um, with so many data quality dimensions out there, which according to you works very well in most cases and why? With so many data quality methods that- Dimensions. Dimensions. Um, what works best and why? Um, well, like you said, there's a lot of dimensions. So uh, let's pick one. Um, I'm not sure I'm totally grokking this, this question either, but I think, hmm. This might have stumped me. Ask me the question one more time. I just want to hear the wording again that they use. Sure, yeah. And it's a loaded <laughs> one. Um, yeah. With so many data quality dimensions out there, which according to you works very well in most cases are on why. Like, where do you even start? Well, okay. So that's like the million dollar question that we get from all of our admins. They're like, awesome. I know I need to do something, but where do I start? Start with profiling. That is going to be your entry point to understanding the issues and just getting your feet wet there. Um, and like I said, there are certain things that we can guarantee everybody is doing. Everybody's fighting duplicates. So if you're just like, hey, I'm going to go tackle my duplicates, that is never a bad place to start if you're just unsure. Um, and then standardization of data. Those are just table stakes because if your data isn't standardized, you're going to have inaccurate reports that are not pulling in a complete data set because who wants to query a state with two different, you know, spellings or three or four, just depending on how people put it in or even a title that is taxing and tiresome. And, you know, it tends to skew the data and what we saw, and I'll just spill the beans here instead of making you go download the, the report for this one is that people were just making up data. So that happens because I think people know that the data sometimes can be questionable um, and it will be hard to track back that if they're asked for a specific set of data to prove a specific point, sometimes they will just flat out make it up. So we have to start getting our data into reportable fashion so we can go back and validate the strategic uh, moves we're making based on what the data is showing us. So dimensions to start with, profiling, of course, but if you just want to dive right in, deduplication and standardization, you will find stuff in your CRM that needs to that done to it. Ah, love it. 
Uh, well, again, Olivia, this has been such a great presentation. So very, very helpful and um, really appreciate it. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything that we do. Great questions that have come in, but I'm afraid that is all the time that we have for this webinar. Uh, and just a reminder, again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording. Uh, and thanks to Validity for sponsoring today's webinar. Olivia, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was great. I, uh, I hope everybody found it useful. And um, if you guys are on LinkedIn, look me up. I, I love to talk data. So I um, would love to connect with more data minds out there. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. I hope y'all have a great day. Thanks. Bye.